Another kind of test we can run for a linear regression model is we could test the significance of a particular specific slope or coefficient. So, for instance, we could test if a tweet rate is significant. We could test to see if tweet rate is above zero. We could test to see if tweet rate is below zero. Notice how we're naming a particular coefficient. When we did a test for the overall significance of the model, it was all coefficients. Here, we're going to look at just one. So, let's test if tweet rate significantly influences movie revenue. Assume alpha equal to 0 0.03. Let's keep it 0 0.06. We should keep actually alpha the same throughout the entire exercise. Okay, so barring my my bad handwriting, to the contrary, we're going to test if tweet rate significantly influences movie revenue. Notice a specific coefficient is named. When we were testing if the overall model was significant, we just said test if the overall model is significant, and there was no specific coefficient mentioned. Here. We are testing to see if the tweet rate, a specific x variable, uh, significantly influences movie revenue. So we're testing a specific coefficient. Now when we test for a specific coefficient, we still have an HO, we still have an HA, we still have a level of significance. We have a test statistic, which is now the t-stat. We have a p-value, we make a decision, we can draw a conclusion. Right? The same six steps still apply. Same six, six steps always apply. Now in this particular case, in step one, we have an HO, we have an HA. Now we're going to roll over and we're going to look at the output. Uh, I'm going to look at the full output here. Here we go. So we have tweet rate. Now intercept will be beta zero. We know this from our experiences with the population model earlier. Tweet rate is the first slope, so it'll be beta 1. If we had other items, they would be beta 2, beta 3, and beta 4. But we just have one slope, so we're testing to see if that beta 1 is equal to 0. Remember, if the slope is 0, it means it has no effect. So we assume tweet rate doesn't help us in any way, doesn't predict anything until we can prove that it does. And so the opposite of beta 1 equals 0 is beta 1 doesn't equal to 0. Step 2, level of significance, which we give to be 0 0.06. Step 3, the test statistic. Now let's talk a little bit about that test statistic before we rush into uh, writing it down. <clears throat> So the test statistic, typically we are testing to see if beta 1 is equal to 0, which is what we're doing now. We could test to see if beta 1 is a specific value or greater than a specific value or less than a specific value. Uh, so we're not restricted to it to be 0, but most of the time it's just that is beta 1 equal to 0 versus beta 1 not equal to 0. We're okay if it has a negative impact because then it tells us if that's something to be avoided. So the fact that it's negative is okay. The fact that it's positive is okay. Uh, right? It still belongs in our model. If it's equal to zero, then it doesn't really doesn't belong in our model. It's not influencing our dependent variable. So uh, the, the convention and, and the default that we see on the output is that uh, beta 1 is going to be assumed to be around zero, right? And uh, so this formula for the t-stat just breaks down into the coefficient value itself relative to its error. It's the error for the specific coefficient. So we compare the co-value of the coefficient, how much we would, and then the error, right, the standard deviation for that coefficient. Uh, and to see if that's a big number, then that coefficient is probably different than zero. And if that number is not very big, the coefficient is likely not that much different than zero. So kind of got an intuitive appeal. If your estimate 
if your error is big relative to your estimate, it could be that the error is, cons you know, overwhelms the coefficient. The coefficient is really not significantly different than zero, and vice versa. So let's roll over to our output. Ba -ba -ba. Here's our output, and we see that tweet rate has a t stat of 9.92. Now we know from our experience that t statistics always have a degree of freedom. Now what's the degrees of freedom here? Well, the degrees of freedom in this case is the same as the error. Okay, same as degrees of freedom for residual in the F stat, okay? Which means it equals to N minus P minus one. And in this case, when I look it up on the output, I see that it equals to 21, okay? So you wanna make sure you know where that 21's coming from. Here's the formula. It's already represented in the F statistics, so if, that's why it's not, doesn't have its own degrees of freedom. Uh, when we look at it on uh, around tweet rate, right? Everything around tweet rate, you have a coefficient, you have a standard error, they build up to the t-stat, and all of a sudden there's just missing degrees of freedom. That's because, you know, everybody who knows statistics know that it's been represented somewhere else. Why duplicate? Step four is the p-value, which we go along. And uh, for us here, it's conveniently, it's called the p-value, is called the p-value. <laughs> I go figure why, uh, and we see that the p-value equals to 2.2 uh, uh, times 10 to the minus 9. Step 5 is like step 5 always is. That p-value, of course, very small, less than alpha. Therefore, we reject h naught. Right? Very small probability of committing a type 1 error by rejecting h naught in this case with a specific alpha of 0.06. And step six, since we've rejected H naught, must mean that uh, tweet rate does significantly uh, influence movie revenue. So we can conclude that tweet rate does, capitalizing does is not required, does significantly influence movie revenue. Okay, so now we can com conclude that it does significantly influence movie revenue. And and we're all set. This is all golden. There's, there's your T-test, right? Very quick, very straightforward, nice little procedure not a lot of pain involved, okay? A couple things just to keep in mind uh, for, for, the, for the, t the T stat is we did test to see if it's significantly different than zero. We could also test to see if it's greater than zero or alternatively less than zero. Um, by default, because of what we were discussing, uh, in most situations and in most cases, all we're concerned about is that it's different than zero, and we don't really care if it's bigger or less than zero, the slope, I mean. So that means that it's a two-tailed test, okay? Uh, we have a degrees of freedom and so on. Now, one-tailed tests are an option, right, if you want to see if the slope is of a certain size, positive slope or negative slope. Uh, and in that case, the p-value would be just a slightly bit different. Uh, you need to go back to the tables or use Excel and then you would just find the probability that you get a specific value bigger or less than a particular number. Okay. So, for instance, um, looking up in, in, in tables, now I've used the tables a little bit different than the ones that uh, are provided on Blackboard just because they had an extra row, uh, a little bit of more degree of uh, small probabilities. Uh, not a major deal. Uh, they, they read the same. They're, they're they're basically still area to the right. And we have degrees of freedom of 21 in this case. And we see that the biggest number along that row of, tw of 21 is 3.5271. So if, if we were uh, 
do an HOHA beta 1 is it positive versus beta 1 that it's negative or zero right and then we'd have our our step 2 of alpha 0 0.06 our step 3 we would still have a t statistic that is the same we'd still have a degrees of freedom that is the same that part doesn't matter step 4 uh, just like we were doing before, it would be a transformation. So we'd find the probability that t greater than, because that's the symbol in uh, HA, greater than 9.92. Okay. Now, what is that equal to? Well, air greater is area to the right. right. So we know that the area to the right, 9.92, is even further to the right, or is larger than 3.5271. So all we know is that this particular probability is going to be less than 0 0.001. Okay, that's all we know, because the smallest probability is 0 0.001. As the t-stats get bigger, the area to the right shrinks. Right? And we see that pattern as we look along that row of the degrees of freedom. Bigger t-statistic area to the right gets smaller. If we're looking at 9.92, we're getting to be way out there. And so it's even going to be even smaller than that 0 0.01 that's up here. We can always punch it in to, uh, into Excel, you know, using the t.dist. Uh, stay away from the two-tailed part because it's not two-tailed. But uh, we can use uh, t.dist uh, to find this exact probability. And we would see that it's very small. And if we would uh, uh, notice its relation to the p-value for the two-tailed test, it's essentially divide by two. Uh, and uh, let's talk a little bit. We'll just wrap this up uh, with uh, a talk about some of the model assumptions. Uh, we, like we've discussed before, we assume that the mean of the error term is zero. That's and, and by the the way that the least squares regression is calculated, uh, mo assumption number one is is forced to be valid. Okay, so there's there's no. Uh, there's no ambiguity as to whether uh, assumption one is followed. It is followed just by the nature of the way that least squared regression works. Uh, assumption one's good. Now the next three, no. <laughs> uh, and so for the second one, is we assume that the variance across all levels of alpha, all values of alpha, remains the same. We call that an assumption of constant variance. It's going to have a fancy name later on, uh, but we will we will learn how to test for this. It's a very nasty little problem. Uh, it can be a little bit tricky to solve or to, to fix, uh, but it's a very important problem to be aware of and very important problem to address if it exists. So we assume that variance is constant, but in many cases, variance is not constant. If we think of things like income, Right? You think of how income is distributed. Well, the variability uh, in dollar amounts of income for people who make $30,000 a year is, is far different than the variability in dollar amounts uh, of someone who makes $3 million a year. Right? And, and so income, house prices, those tend to be variables that are just by their nature or not don't have constant variance. And so we'll, we'll, there, there are tools that we can, we can use to deal with them, a little bit beyond the, the scope of the class, but we will, we will talk about testing them. And then when we get to that section, we'll, we'll throw out a couple of mechanisms that, 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 worry, that we could address it. And then it's just a matter of uh, you know, playing around with it a little bit. Uh, next thing is we assume that the values of the errors are independent from each other. Okay. So one error term does not relate it to another error term. And when this is violated, this is called autocorrelation. And we'll talk about tests for autocorrelation uh, later on as well. So that's coming up. You know, we'll, we'll be a, a looking at these issues uh, in the future, these model assumption violations, I guess. And then the fourth assumption is that the errors are normally distributed. Right now, at our level in, in 312, we'll worry about looking at that through the lens of a probability plot, a p-plot. 
but easily there are there are many uh, there's a Levine test for normality there's lots of other tests for normality that also you could use to maybe make it more formal uh, the, the evaluation of this more formal and, and you know just be aware that they exist and then after that it's a matter of hunting them down which I, I'm sure you're more than capable of doing it certainly will be after the end of the course uh, so when we come back last clip we'll just do some applications and the applications will be a, a, in the uh, in, in finance, because finance is fun.